and then uh, share the screen so that we can look at the cactus uh, or the cactus family for today. So before I mentioned something very important in class about uh, cactus and succulents. So a succulent is a plant that evolves to somehow store water, whether it be the stem, whether it be the roots, whether it be the leaves, or any of the other body parts. And uh, do our cacti a succulent plant? The answer is yes. Uh, however, the cactus do have their own family. So succulents like euphorbia have their own family. Succulents like agave have their own family. Uh, and so in order for a plant to be referred to as a cactus, it will definitely have to fall under the cactus family, which is what we're gonna be talking about today. So we have a lot of different cactus that are gonna be out there uh, that we can uh, learn about. Uh, what's very important is that the majority of the cactus are gonna be from the Americas. Now, there is one that is found in Africa. They are not really sure if it was introduced from uh, to Africa early on. Uh, but we know the vast majority in the plant family has its origin in South America. And so you're going to have the majority of diversity in Americas. And now, obviously, they are taken into different parts of the world. But the origin of them is going to be in the Americas. Somewhere in South America, back uh, many years ago, that was the origin of the plant. Uh, they are going to be dicots. Uh, and uh, that's going to mean that they're going to be broad leaves and uh, they're going to have two seedling leaves when the seed germinates. And so here's a dragon fruit uh, seedling, a baby plant. Uh, and uh, when it first germinates, it's going to have the two seedling leaves, the cotyledons, uh, remnants from uh, the ancestor that will fall off. And then you have a stem. Uh, here we see the stem, which is now has the prickles or the modification of the leaves that we'll see later on. But during the baby stage, uh, many plants will show the features uh, that were probably important in, at some point in time, but later on adopted as they evolved and learned to take advantage of several microclimates and niches throughout the, the world. And uh, here's a different one, uh, one of those uh, 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 crab cactus uh, or epiphyllums and uh, we see the seedling leaves and then we have now the true stem uh, in which uh, the leaves are now here at the nodes uh, now more of the adult type plant so we have characteristics from the juvenile stage so do cactus have leaves yes uh, they're either modified or during the baby stage uh, they'll have the, those uh, cotyledons and uh, what's the origin of the cactus? The origin of the cactus was probably a common ancestor that gave rise to a weedy plant that we know as purslane. Uh, it's a common plant out there. It's eaten by people. So a purslane, purslane like ancestor, probably a succulent, just like purslane, from South America was what gave rise to uh, the Perchulacaceae, which is a purslane family, and the Cactaceae, which is the cactus family. And I have the two individuals side by side. So you see that there's going to be a lot of similarities in the flowers. Both of them are going to be succulent. Both of them are going to have very showy flowers, lots of stamens, and a lot of the same features. So that's because they are very close together. Uh, there was just a common ancestor that divided in two and created the two, sub, uh, the two families. Uh, and so that ancestor had its origin back when there was just one continent uh, in, in what is known, uh, now known as South America. That's where they believed uh, many millions of years ago that a common ancestor arose. And as the land masses started to separate, that then uh, moved them into different areas with different climates, uh, and that started to allow them to evolve. Uh, and it is said that 
uh, the cactus uh, jumped into the northern part in what is known right now as Cuba. Uh, and then it jumped from the South American uh, continent into the North America. I guess it's uh, Laurasia. Uh, I think that's the old name. Uh, and then when it got into what is now known as Central Mexico, then it really began to diversify. Then it found uh, the deserts uh, and a bunch of other microclimates that allowed it to definitely diversify. And now they are, can be found even in North America in areas where there is snow. So from the tropics, they have managed to evolve and tolerate uh, some colder temperature because of some of their adaptations. So two plants, very similar, portulacase, purslanes, uh, or uh, cactus side by side. And so the evolution would have gone something like this, a very tiny purse-like like, uh, ancestor, this is actually purslane, uh, then gave rise to the pereschia, the pereschia, the rose cactus that we saw earlier in the semester with uh, real leaves and a stem. So that would have been the tropical cactus. That's still kind of more of a primitive uh, uh, cacti. And then uh, when they found uh, the niche of being epiphytic, then it evolved into the ripsalis that we saw the drunkard's, uh, drunkard's uh, dream today. And then as it then migrated into the drier climate, then it became known as the regular cacti, the columnar cactus that we see with the freckles in the spine. So as it went into different uh, environment, different microclimates, different temperatures, different habitats, it kept changing and evolving uh, from just a tiny purslane to the big cactus that we have now. And so here is uh, a shot of just a regular scenery uh, in a dry habitat with uh, different types of cactus. Uh, these are gonna be more of the columnar cactus that we may see and uh, in, Oaxaca, the area of high diversity for cactus. Uh, this is the scenery on top of the mountains uh, where the cactus have taken hold and is sharing uh, some of the habitat with uh, plumerias and a bunch of other also dry uh, loving plant. And over here is uh, hills and mountains completely covered. So where the cactus are gonna be one of the more dominant uh, plants in the, its habitat. Uh, and then uh, when we look uh, here in the desert, we see the different diversity that they have achieved. Uh, we're gonna find many different sizes in the cactus. Uh, and we are gonna have the saguaro as the tallest and the largest cactus in the world uh, here in California. It will make it into California in the Whipple Mountains, uh, but obviously Arizona and our uh, saguaro national park would be more of their habitat. And then we have some with a flat stem and some that are gonna be a little more, less smaller, but cylindrical. Uh, and so to understand them, we gotta now look at the two, three different subfamilies. So the cactus uh, ancestor evolved into uh, the subfamily Cactioides, which is a cactoli, uh, Perischioides, the Perischias, or Opuntioides, uh, the Opuntias or the beaver tail. Uh, cactus. So we'll get to see them. Uh, the opuntioides would be the more diverse individual that we'll see. Uh, so starting with uh, cactioides, uh, that would be our Perischia, Perischia grandiflora, the rose cactus. And here showing you the true leaves that it will keep or uh, will keep on producing. Obviously, this is a tropical cactus, so it does not have the need uh, to drop the leaves because dropping the leaves or changing the leaves was a consequence of uh, drying out uh, because the leaves will have uh, will dry out a lot quicker. Uh, so here's just some of the photographs that I have shared with you before on those uh, rose cactus. And uh, here's a different Perischia. Uh, this one uh, will have a stem and it's also now going to start to create some kind of fleshy fruit. Uh, in this case, they're not going to be as good as some of the cultivated ones that people will normally eat. But there is now a fleshy fruit that will entail or involve an animal eating the fruit and uh, dispersing the seeds. Uh, the cactus are going to pretty much be 
safe to eat or not really have any real poison, to say the least, uh, because they use uh, weapons. They use pine sprinkles or hiding uh, in order to defend themselves. So they do not, uh, the ancestor did not uh, develop or evolve any kind of serious chemicals as a defense mechanism that is more with the spurge than the cactus. And so it is not uncommon to see prickles, spines, uh, armaments, uh, weapons uh, all over. In this case, uh, the fruit uh, has some kind of spines and some of them can be quite large. So here is a Perescia from Chiap, uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. And it's going to even look like a regular tree. So we have a nice central stem uh, with lots of spines. And then we have uh, some more of a standard branching, a more of what you're going to find with regular trees or regular plants. Uh, but this is a cactus. Uh, but it's one of those multi-branch with uh, uh, leaves. This would come from a tropical dry deciduous forest. So in the highlands of uh, Mexico, in the mountains, it is hot. Uh, but during a certain period of the year, it's not going to rain, so it's going to be very dry, and they'll drop the leaves as a consequence of that or as a result of that. So dry, deciduous, uh, tropical forest, there is such a thing. Uh, and uh, here's the fruits uh, when it's leafed out and uh, the leaves and everything else. Uh, and so that's the cactioides. Uh, and then... Uh, Sorry, that is the periscioides, uh, to refer, uh, refer that. Uh, the cactioides, which is going to be uh, the ripsalis. Uh, these are going to be the common name is mistletoe cactus, as I mentioned before. So here they are growing in uh, the habitat in South America, uh, right out of a tree. So an animal dropped the leaves and in this case, uh, the seeds. And in this case, the seed kind of took refuge in between the moss. It germinated and it grew. Uh, it is not a parasite, so it is just uh, growing in the moss and uh, holding onto the bark of the tree and catching whatever water it can. Uh, and uh, that's what we have here. And here are the flowers. So the flowers will follow the standard for the cactus. They are going to be very showy, and that is something very important, that cactus will have some of the most uh, amazing and big and showy flowers out of uh, many plant families and they're going to be quite large in many of them. Uh, and so here's uh, the tip of some of those uh, with uh, uh, the flowers and uh, here's a, a different one. Uh, here's a flat stem and you can see the flowers facing down because uh, they're going to be more of a bell shape and uh, there's when I took the photograph of them uh, face on. And or this uh, that kind of looks like a pencil cactus. So uh, some of those cactus started to take advantage of the new niche, which was to grow on top of trees and avoid competition in the ground. Then uh, they started lose start, stop, started to lose the leaves. And so now the photosynthesis uh, process will take place on the stems and the stems are going to be a lot stronger and they're not going to dry as quickly. And that is why you may see just a bunch of what resembles the pencil cactus, but they're in fact uh, cactus and the flowers will show you just that. And here's a different view of those uh, flowers. They're small, but they're still quite noticeable uh, for them. And Here's a photo that I've shown before. And just a few more that I, I have grown or I have seen uh, because there are going to be some people who are going to be collecting them. Uh, here's one that I had growing here in the garden during the full blooming period and all the flowers uh, that it started to produce. And here's the, the flowers for the, the Drunken's Dream. Uh, so I mentioned they were yellow, so there's at the tips. Uh, when it was flowering and there's the stems uh, for this individual and the flowers. And uh, so here's just a collection and being an epiphytic, so a moss basket or a wire basket, as you see here growing at Lotus Land. So this is uh, their display. Uh, some of them here's with the fruit uh, that looks like mistletoe. And that's why I mentioned the common name for many of them is, uh, and there's some more fruit 
uh, not good, not edible by people, mainly by birds. And in Sherman uh, Library, uh, here's a very nice display, a very old specimen uh, hanging from uh, uh, the ceiling and it had fruits and uh, for, I don't think it had a flower, but there's uh, the name for this one uh, from South America. And uh, there's a fruit. And even for during a uh, beauty pageant for plants, uh, there was uh, uh, the Fern Society who would have a show, Ferns and Exotic Plants. And these are some of the better specimens that people have been growing and displaying them for a blue ribbon. So the collectors that they like this specific group of cacti and some of them with the fruit. Uh, and there's a close up of those. Uh, and just more shots of uh, the wild here uh, in Argentina uh, growing uh, from the trees. So that is the Cactioides, the correction, uh, that is the Ripsalis and those epiphytic. The Perischioides are going to be the ones with the true leaves. And now we can look at the Opuntioides or the Opuntias would be the type specimen, uh, which are going to be the others. And we're going to start with uh, uh, this one, again, from South America, Central and South America, uh, it's going to be kind of the beginning. Uh, it is uh, known in Spanish as patilon, but it's going to be a kind of branching individual. It grows in really big thickets. Here it has been used uh, as a fence. So you put it on top, it grows very quickly. It is loaded with uh, spines, so nobody's going to touch it. Uh, and so here's on top of the fence, nobody's going to climb and jump over, and the flower begins to get really big. Uh, and you can see the stem, it's succulent, and the spines are very, very long and sharp. And it still has some leaves. Uh, so this was kind of maybe the beginning, and then it started to diversify from there. Uh, here's a different one uh, that we have here. Uh, with the fruits, uh, and it's been grown by med uh, by people for medicinal purposes. Or then you have the opuntia, which is uh, the beaver tail cactus. So now we have a flat stem, uh, we have a branching plant, uh, and then depending on the selection or some of the wild, they may be loaded with lots of prickles, or if it's a human selections that are were selected for eating, you're gonna find less prickles. So it's easier for them to peel and process. Uh, but some of them will still have the leaves. So we do have some opuntias that will have a very succulent leaf, as you see here, very nice and slender. Or the eating uh, cactus will have the young leaves. Or when the pad is very small, you'll see the leaves also round and succulent those will fall off early and they will get replaced by the prickles, which are now the modification of those leaves. So even here, some members may have either reduced uh, leaves or the leaves are gonna be present only during their younger stage or later on, they're just gonna be completely gone. Uh, but there will be some remnants uh, of uh, that in some of the others. And so here's a barrel cactus and now we have the leaves that will play a very different role. Uh, so here's uh, the leaves are going to be golden and they are going to be uh, changed into a prickle or a sp uh, spine. And so this was very mm. important modification because it's going to play a very important role. Role number one, it's going to be for protection. So obviously the cactus are going to store water. They do not have chemical defenses. And so they're going to rely on uh, the spines to keep animals away from stealing the water. But it also going to provide a sunscreen. So when you take the temperature of the plant at the skin level below the spines, it's going to be several degrees lower than the ambient temperature. So when the plant decided to move into the desert and needed protection from the sun, then the spines evolve and change for that. Or as we look at some of the cactus later on that can grow in very cold climates, it is because the spines will keep the snow away from the stem and prevent the frost or freezing the plant. And so that is gonna be the major role of some of those modified leaves or the spines or the prickles. 
Uh, we also have a few of the epiphyllum. These are known as orchid cactus that are going to be from South America. They'll have many large leaves. They're epiphytic, uh, flat stem, uh, but they'll have one of the nicest big flowers. Uh, so here's a very large flower with a very large tube, most likely pollinated by a moth. Uh, or some of them are going to be very beautiful. These are the orchid cactus. Uh, there is also a large group of followers, uh, the Orchid Cactus Society or Epiphyllum Society, because that's going to be the, the genus for most of them. Uh, and so here is just a couple of them that were under collection. And even the dragon fruit uh, would fall under this category uh, of epiphytic, uh, epiphytic cactus. Uh, so uh, here's a very large flower and many of them, depending on where they come from, uh, may open at night because uh, the natural pollinator may be a bat or if it opens the day, maybe an insect or something else. Uh, so there's the flowers for that. Uh, and uh, an epiphytic grown in a, a basket with moss. Uh, and this one uh, showing you the side view of the flowers and uh, the face view of the flowers. And uh, here, this one for sale. Uh, when it's in flower, it's very nice. Otherwise, it's just a flat cactus and it might not be as interesting. So different selection, different types, uh, and they will flower during the fall. So it should be blooming uh, right now. Uh, and a different view of some of those. So keep those in mind, orchid cactus, because they are very nice and they are very beautiful. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about flowers. And then we have uh, the rat tail cactus here as a type of filling type. Uh, stems are gonna be round. Uh, prickles, yes, but not really severe. Uh, so here's uh, the flowers. Uh, in this case, the flowers are gonna be more trumpet-like because uh, many of the cactus being from America evolved for, uh, to be pollinated by hummingbirds. And so this is where the hummingbirds will go and hover uh, drink the nectar uh, from the tube and then no need to land. Uh, and here's some of the climbing ones. So here being used as a wall or on a wall. So yeah, they can climb. Uh, they have roots that will cling onto the stems of trees. So in nature, they'll climb on trees and get to the canopy. And later on, as the bottom portion dies off or rots, then it becomes a completely epiphytic plant. So they may be both terrestrial and epiphytic in time. Uh, and so here's uh, another collection. This one is from the Arboretum. Different styles, different shapes, different sizes, uh, and like the different selections that were being displayed and that were flowering uh, during the time when I was there. Uh, so different type of epiphyllum. Or there's uh, the Anthony Rickrack, uh, and this is becoming more popular once again, uh, but here was uh, growing at Naples Island. So one of the owners had a very large plant. Uh, and fortunately I did not see it flower because uh, the flowers are in the night. Uh, and uh, at some point here's a flower that somebody was displaying uh, in some of the shows. Uh, and it will be in this category where the Christmas cactus will fall under. So yes, the Christmas cactus is a type of like an epiphyllum type. Uh, epiphytic, epiphyllum, and so here's the flowers uh, for this individual that we've seen in class. Uh, or I mentioned there's different kinds, so here's a spring cactus forced to flower in the spring. Here's uh, white flowers uh, for this individual. Or we have uh, the beaver tail, uh, the flat stem with lots of prickles. This one being more of a wild form, so that's how they're supposed to be. And uh, some of them can get quite large. So there are going to be many species. Some of them are going to be small. Some of them, when given the opportunity, uh, they can get quite high in size. Uh, and uh, this one is showing you uh, the flowers, which could also be quite nice when you look at them. Uh, or uh, this one growing in uh, Naples, on Naples Island. Uh, we have... Uh, a nice uh, upright stem and uh, kind of some branching towards the top with uh, the pads and uh, the flowers uh, or uh, this one silvery, very drought resistant, uh, extremely rigid, extremely hard, hardy and here's the flowers for those. 
And uh, these ones are from Cuba. So yes, there is a wild cactus in Cuba. So the different Caribbean islands have different endemisms and cactus jumped onto them uh, early on. And as the islands move away from each other, each of the cactus kind of evolve into its own different species. Uh, so this one is uh, wild in Cuba and uh, it has even bigger spines uh, than some of the other cactus. And uh, here's the flowers. And uh, in Cuba, just growing next to the water or very close to the water, just on top of a rock, uh, this beautiful uh, specimen. And uh, here's uh, how it naturally grows uh, and protects itself. And then we have uh, some of the columnar cactus. So the ones that will get a lot bigger. So this will be very narrow and they'll branch and they'll get big. Uh, and here we have a few other uh, specimens. And so, and uh, here overlooking uh, one of the bays in Cuba, we have some of the wild columnar cactus uh, we have. And so when we start looking at how the diversity of cactus, uh, there's gonna be a few categories that we can look into them. Uh, the first one is gonna be referred to as bis bisnagita, which means these are the mammillarias. That will be the genus. These are gonna be the small uh, round individuals. And as they get bigger, then they're gonna be called bisnaga or those who are gonna be the barrel cactus. So these are gonna be the small round individuals, uh, the bisnagitas or the medium size to so small, which are gonna be the barrel cactus. So that's gonna be one form. What is also very important for you to understand that as the cactus evolve in drier habitat, uh, they have to be able to drink water very quickly because the rain would come through the desert in monsoon. So it's gonna be very quick showers and then it's gonna go away. And so one of the adaptations for cacti is that they're gonna have a lot of the leaves, sorry, the roots, on the surface, because as the water infiltrates the soil, they wanna drink it or get it as quickly as possible so that they can store it. Storing the water is gonna be crucial for them. So if they do not store enough water, uh, they'll die uh, from uh, lack of water or drought. And so the quicker they're able to take the water in, the easier for them to see, uh, secure uh, future. Uh, and so, having a lot of surface roots is gonna be very common, which means that if you are gonna be dealing with cactus in the ground, try to minimize disturbing the roots because that's not gonna be good for them. Uh, the other thing that is going to be important for you to understand with cacti is that you're gonna see the, this uh, fold. So the stem has to be flexible. And so developing this folds allows the plant to expand when it absorbs the water. So when it's, uh, the cactus is very nice and hydrated, this is gonna be a lot thicker and it's gonna be, the folds are gonna be less. And so being able to drink water very quickly and be able to hold it is going to be very important in the survival of cacti in the desert. And that's why we have this ridges and folds as part of the anatomy of the cacti to be able to expand as they drink the water very quickly and hold it uh, and or as cacti gets less water or as they go through us a, a, uh, a drought period some cacti in some of the desert may not be getting a drop of water in five six eight years and so it's going to survive on whatever water it has and as it uses it it's going to slowly shrink 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 and then when it rains, it's going to get plump again and continue on growing. So bisnagitas, barrel cactus or bisnaga. Bisnagitas here are mammillaria would be the a genus that is very common uh, here being displayed at the Huntington Library. And here is growing in the wild. So there is, uh, these are California native uh, growing right out in the sand dunes by the beach. That's where you would find them or in, amongst rocks. And they would also have a very beautiful flower. So here's where they flower and all these flowers are covering the entire plant. Uh, and just in a couple of nurseries where I've seen them uh, with flowers, some of them getting a little bit taller. Uh, and uh, here's a close up of the flowers. So very nice, very showy. 
Uh, and uh, you can also see the spines kind of creating a nice coat, a covering for the stem to regulate temperature. Uh, and this one is also California native. This is Mamillaria louisi. Uh, and it is known for just having the top of the plant creeping or peeping uh, on top of the soil. The rest of the plant is below the ground, so you never see the entire uh, plant itself. Uh, all you might see are going to be the top, and this is very difficult to locate or find when it's not in bloom. So we were lucky to see it in flower here and with buds, so that makes it easier to detect uh, because it's going to use cryptic. It's going to hide below the ground to prevent it from drying out and dying. And so when it's nice and wet or during the rainy season here in California, that's when it's going to be actively growing set flowers and then kind of uh, go to back to being cryptic below, uh, just about soil level. So that is the nature of the beast, uh, just growing a little bit above the soil line. Uh, or here's uh, some in containers being offered for sale. But you see uh, the different ones that have different covering different patterns in the prickles. And this one has the flowers right here, just kind of creeping out. Uh, and there's a shot of that with the flowers. Uh, and uh, here's a couple of other ones uh, with flowers and just a few more that I uh, keep finding. And some very nice large specimens. Uh, in this case, uh, some of the prickles, some of the leaves have evolved into a hair-like uh, structure. Uh, the hair like that can also be very important for cacti to protect them from the cold or to reflect the sunlight, reflect the heat. Uh, and uh, it's going to be found in the more crucial point, which is going to be the tip or the center, which is where the flowers are going to come out of. Uh, and this is Mamillaria genuinospina, the twin spine. Uh, and here's uh, the flowers, so this extra cotton, this extra leaves that are modified into this cotton-like material or threads, uh, it's going to protect the valuable apical stem, which is right here, or meristem, and the valuable flowers because those will dry out. Uh, and here's uh, another one on uh, display uh, with the flowers and uh, more sharper spines and some more here with a combination of large spines and hairs and a bunch of others. And uh, in a container, it was flowering, so I had to take a photograph. And getting a little bit bigger, so now we can look at like the barrel cactus-like. Uh, so some of this uh, with very showy flower. And then we have more of the standard barrel cactus uh, this also being a very large specimen at the Huntington Library. So if you've never been to the Huntington Library, it is a great place to see probably some of the very nice or the nicest uh, cactus and succulents because they do have a world-renowned cactus and succulent garden and it's not too far from here, from Long Beach. So here's uh, Bisnagitas uh, or Mamillarias and a few other smaller cacti. And then we have the Golden Spine barrel cactus that we have here and uh, it's also flowering and uh, it also has extra covering extra padding for the sun protection where the apical stem or mary stem should be and uh, here's uh, the flowers of this individual or some of them that the plant itself may not be that attractive but it's the spines or the prickles that would be very colorful so this one being a uh, bright, bright red. And on top, we have the fruit that came after the flowers. And so here's the flowers with the fruits and buds all mixed together. Uh, or here's uh, one with purple. And uh, they are eaten. So people will sacrifice them. Uh, if somebody's dying out of thirst in the desert, yes, they can be saved by the humidity uh, or the moisture in uh, inside this cacti. They are really nasty tasting. So as far as taste, they're horrible. They're really bitter, uh, but you're dying. So you need the humidity. So you can just take a piece of the heart and uh, you would put it in your mouth and slowly the you would drink the water. So you don't really chew it. You don't really squeeze out the water. 
you just get the humidity directly from a piece of the heart. Uh, but it is not uncommon for people to make a sweet out of them. So here is bisnaga heart being offered as a candy. It's just it's just very sweet. It's just a lot of sugar. There is no real distinct flavor to say that, oh yeah, this is a fantastic uh, 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 candy. It's just very sweet candy that is kind of flavorless, just sweet. Uh, so no need to kill them unless you're dying in the desert and you need to be safe, so that's okay. But otherwise, there's no need to make them into candy because it's horrible. Uh, and so here's uh, some other barrel cactus, smaller with uh, yellow flowers uh here and some with the uh, white uh, and so here's also from the wild uh with the, some yellow flowers and buds and flowers and all that some of the nurseries were growing from seeds and so here's some that are uh ready in a six inch container uh from home depot i think and uh sometimes you may see them with the flower and those are obviously taken or in the landscape uh, here, uh, just planted and I was able to take some beautiful uh, photographs of this flower uh, or in the landscape uh, around here, uh, you may see them expensive because they will grow slow. And so some of these ones that have many years of age will require some care and they're gonna be expensive. Or if you happen to go out here in California to the desert, uh, this is Anza Borrego. And uh, during the summer, uh, here it is uh, growing right out of the rock. Uh, so some seeds just found a little niche, uh, enough soil, germinated, grew. And uh, it's amazing some of the places where cactus can grow out of. But yeah, in nature, if that's all they got, that's what they can do. And this one being very happy and quite old was also flowering. Uh, and uh, it was completely covered with prickles. It's from the desert. It needs that extra protection. Uh, and so here's the flowers. And uh, here I was able to even photograph some uh, beetles uh, that are completely covered with pollen. Uh, and uh, probably they're going to be their pollinator for some of these members. Uh, or in the nursery that uh, propagates a lot of succulents. So this was where they would grow some specimens and collect the seeds. And these are some of the specimens that they have grown from seeds and ready to sell. And in Oaxaca, I came across this that's taller than I am. Uh, and uh, it was a rescue. So they were building a road. And uh, obviously this very large, very old uh, barrel cactus was, was in the way. And uh, they were able to dig it out and uh, transplant it into the Oaxacan Botanic Garden, which is where we are here. Uh, and so it's been one of the biggest ones. And then uh, in Cuba, so this is Malocactus growing in the wild, and this is just side of the cliff. Uh, and uh, there's very little to no soil, uh, but the roots can grow in between the cracks of the rock. Uh, and uh, here's uh, uh, what it looks like when it's closed. So it's very distinct. You usually see it in like cactus show. I have never, never seen it for sale like in the normal nurseries. Uh, but I did not see the flowers. I saw the fruit, uh, the fruit for this individual right here. But it's this uh, smaller stem. It's uh, the nature of the beast. Uh, so that's what is people like to grow. And uh, here's the fruit uh, for this individual. Uh, and then we're going to have a different group. These are going to be more of the cylindrical type that are going to be known as the choyas. Uh, these are going to be very fragile because they will reproduce by simply dropping to the ground. So the stems will break very easily. Uh, they'll drop to the ground or if uh, an animal happens to get by it, the sprinkles will get on the animal's fur skin and hopefully they'll drop the choya or the piece of choya somewhere else. And that is gonna be one method of um, moving around and reproducing. So they will break up very easily. Uh, here is uh, Cylindropuntia. So this one at the Fullerton Arboretum and uh, it had uh, some flowers. There are native Cylindropuntias here to Southern California. And so this, uh, this was here on an island. This is um, San Martin Island off of uh, San Quintin. 
And uh, just trekking through an island that is loaded with choya, it is not a pleasant experience uh, because the moment you touch them with your foot, your shoes, they'll go through your tennis shoes or your boots, or they'll get stuck to your boots. And uh, the moment that you take a high step, then you bring them into cross proximity to your upper thigh where they will be stuck to your leg. And so inevitably they can move from the bottom of your boot, which is okay to your upper thigh or even a bit higher than that. And it's, it's very dangerous. Uh, and so here's just trekking through it very carefully, uh, trying to look for plants. And uh, here's uh, photographing a beaver tail, but all around that we have choyas that are probably just close from one another, pieces that just went and dropped. Uh, but they can create a thicket and nobody's going to go through there because it's it's quite a painful experience. And uh, here in the desert, uh, in the Sonora Desert, we have the beaver, er, teddy bear choyas. Uh, teddy bear choyas because they're going to be completely covered uh, with prickles. And uh, I've heard stories of people being in the desert and being drunk and falling and having this stuck to their face. And it's... It's not a pleasant experience, uh, but I guess it could happen. And those could also have a very nice flower. Uh, so here's a different view. And uh, a very nice red beetle serving as a pollinator for this. Uh, and uh, here in Anza Borrego, so here's a different choya native to that uh, desert. Uh, or uh, the Southern California, this is uh, Cilindro Punta Pari, so growing out of Griffith Park. Uh, the parking lot is from Travel Town. Uh, so this would be the western end uh, of this uh, species uh, out of Griffith Park. And uh, I photographed this in June, uh, not this year, but a few couple of years ago uh, with uh, a lot of native insects uh, serving as the pollinator. And then as the choyas or as the cactus get bigger and become more of a tree-like, then they are referred to as cardone. Uh, and so that would be the uh, uh, more like the cylinder or the bigger specimen like the saguaro is a type of cardone. Uh, and so here is uh, in Baja, California. Uh, so I went to see some of the larger one, not in the California Pacific province, but south of that. Uh, and here they are growing uh, next to Bujum, which is a plant that is uh, in the Ocotillo family that is only uh, endemic to Baja California and it just grows in this uh, certain specific area. And there I am for scale with uh, some of the cardones uh, from uh, Baja California, or some of those can be used for making fences. So this is the fence cactus. Uh, it's commonly used here in Southern California as well for decorations, but here, uh, put side by side, it creates a very nice fence, natural fence. Uh, and uh, when they died, this is uh, this, the skeleton, uh, the skeleton of the saguaro cactus. Uh, this individual perished uh, for whatever reason. And uh, the skeleton is going to be kind of woody. Uh, and it has to be strong enough to support some of these bigger cactus with lots of water. So a single saguaro can weigh, can be very heavy because of all the water that I may have inside. And so here's uh, the ribs that I mentioned before. Uh, for the saguaro, it comes from the desert. Uh, and so during the monsoons, uh, yeah, they will expand uh, these ribs, absorb all the water they can so that they can survive several years. Uh, without any water, and uh, that's uh, how they're going to get plump or get skinny. The other very important thing about cactus that you need to be aware of is that cactus are going to employ what is known as a nurse plant. So what will happen is that during the juvenile stage or during the seedling stage when the seed germinates, if the cactus was to germinate in the open, it will probably not make it because it's too hot and it's too dangerous. Uh, mainly the temperature, it has not developed the thick skin or whatever defenses or sunscreen that it needs. And so it is very important that for the very first years of its life, the plant is going to rely on a nurse plant, a different plant 
that will protect it or give it a little bit of shade. So here is uh, the example of a Palo Verde, the blue Palo Verde. And most likely what happened here was a bird probably uh, sat on the plant, on the Palo Verde, and it dropped the seed. The seeds from the cacti found the perfect area. They germinated. They were found protection for, uh, by the plant. And as it gets older, eventually when it outgrows its nurse plant, then the plant, the cactus will be ready to tolerate the heat and then they'll be off uh, on their own. But it is very important and crucial that during the seedling stage that they are protected by a nurse plant. And so here is, uh, from uh, Palo Verde. And as you go around the desert, you will find different examples. So here is uh, in uh, Nevada, and uh, we have a very young cactus, and it's just growing underneath the nurse plant. Uh, and over here is a different uh, desert. So this one employed a yucca as a nurse plant. And so here's a cacti taking some refuge in between the plants. Uh, so that's very important for the survival uh, or as they uh, move uh, migrate north or they started taking advantage of the northern deserts, then that was important for them to survive. The other thing that is going to be very important is the modification of the leaves. So the leaves are going to be changed into uh, spines and the, the rifle name is going to be areolis. So that is the lingo for uh, the cactus uh, spine. And so it is going to be in a circular pattern because that would be kind of looking from the top of any plant. Uh, the leaves are going to be alternate and they're going to be away from each other. Because they are very compressed, uh, they are going to create this circular pattern on uh, some of the cacti. And so you see them also here in this barrel cactus, they're going to be in a circular pattern. And then you have uh, in this mammillaria, you have the same thing. So those are the modified leaf tight and now acting as a defense mechanism. And so when you have a plant that dies, obviously the leaf, uh, the spines will remain. And so here's the skeleton of the plant made up by the spines themselves or the areoles. And uh, for botanizing or for uh, uh, determining plant species or collection, uh, the areoles will play a very important role because they are going to be different with uh, the different species of cactus. So here is a plant press and a, a pen for scale. And all you need is just a piece of that. Uh, it is very difficult to press or preserve cactus because they mold very easily. And the other thing that's very interesting, when you see some of the bigger uh, cacti and the areoles, if you look where the vascular system is, sometimes they may form a face. So here's a happy face or somebody smiling. And that could be something fun to show the children, but that is nothing more than the vascular system that was connected to the prickles because they are the leaves. So there's still some connection uh, to the vascular system of the plant. And so here's a uh, botanist uh, Richard Felger uh, from Arizona and uh, uh, collected some cholla, and uh, the important thing is more of the skin, so you have to scrape out all of the fleshy portions so that it doesn't mold, and then you can press it, or you can pick on it, or do something else. But having the skin with the areoli, it's vital for collecting and classifying cactus, uh, and so that's what he's doing. The other thing that is going to be important are going to be the glaucides. Uh, and this is what we refer to as ajuates or aguates in Spanish. And so these are going to be another modifications. But what I want you to show is uh, obviously not my photograph, but this scanning microscope uh, photography where you have the glaucai that have bars facing the opposite direction. And so normally when you get poked by one of these, you're not going to feel it. It's not going to hurt going in but pulling it because of the bars that are facing the opposite direction is going to be very painful. Uh, so this is just a mechanism for them to defend themselves or in some cases with the choyas uh, to stick to the animal fur and or the skin and then may drop somewhere else. 
So some of the glaucides are going to be very hair-like and just coming in close contact with them. If you just kind of touch them a little bit, they'll go very easily into your skin and then you're going to need some duct tape or something else to get them out. So the bigger spine are going to be the areoles or the areoles is that cluster uh, would be considered like a node on the plant and the glaucide would be a modification of some of the spines into more vicious things. Uh, and so here's a beaver cactus and you see the very nice soft hairs and people who do not know cacti are going, oh, look, uh, so soft and like, ee. Uh, and I have known many folks who like they touch it or it even come close to it or just barely scrape it and they have all this areolis on their skin. Uh, but some of them are going to become hairs. Uh, they're going to be soft. They're not going to be pokey. And so here's some of the examples of what they sometimes refer to as all main cactus. And now the, ca the areoles and the spines and the prickles are going to be protecting the tree, uh, the plant, uh, either from cold or also the sunlight. And so here's uh, those areoles. And uh, you can see the, how they cast a shadow. So they cast a shadow onto the plant and that shadow is going to keep the temperature lower. Uh, but there's still enough light to go inside for photosynthesis, uh, but it's more important for them to be cool or uh, have the temperature lower at the skin. Uh, and so those spines that are now dead are gonna play that role. Uh, and here's some that are just almost completely covered. Uh, and or so here's a, a couple more uh, and a few more there. And even this one is a mammillaria. It's almost completely covered. It has a nice fluffy coat, I guess. Uh, and it's just going to reflect a lot of the heat, but still allow some light to go through. Um, and uh, I mentioned about the cold. So here is uh, on top of the Andes Mountains. So in my last trip to Peru, uh, we were on top of the mountains, over 4,000 meters in elevation, very cold. Uh, very small plants because of the wind, and there were cactus growing. Uh, and uh, here's uh, the cacti. So portion of it was being uh, insulated by the moss uh, that was growing underneath it, and the top portion that was already above the moss was being insulated by the hairs or by the glaucides that now play a role as hairs. Uh, and so here is uh, this is individual and. I was very happy when uh, we were able to find the flowers. Uh, so here's where the hairs are gonna be more valuable as an insulation to keep the uh, cactus nice and at least warm and toasty or at least keep the frost away. Uh, it still has some protection. So some of them have not changed uh, entirely into hairs. And here's a close up of uh, this individual. Uh, and then when I looked at a few more, I mean, it's just a white blanket. Those are all cacti. And I was also very happy because one of them had a fruit. Uh, and so here's the fruit for this individual. And I'm sure some yama or other animal would be happy to find that. Uh, and uh, here's uh, now talking about the fruit. Uh, the fruit will come out of the stem because uh, the green portion, maybe flat, maybe round, uh, will produce the flowers. Uh, the flowers here will be very showy. Uh, and uh, here's uh, the mammillaria, also showing you some of the nicer flower displays for a very tiny cactus. Sometimes in very large numbers, the flowers will have. And then here's in Cuba, and uh, one that flowered during the night, but it was loaded with flowers. Uh, and so when we look at the flowers, uh, it's not going to have a lot of uh, interesting features. It's just going to have many petals. So there's not a single number like a few of the other plants that we've seen, or the plant flowers are not going to be too complex. Uh, so it's just going to have many petals and also many sepals. Here's the example of a dragon fruit. And then uh, when we look at the petals and the sepals, here they are very different. Petals are white, sepals are yellowish green. And then when we look inside, we're going to have a lot of stamens. And then the stigma will be lobed. So it's kind of going to have like finger likes. And so that would be the stigma. That is where the pollen will need to be deposited with the style that leads down to the ovary. 
So again, very simplistic, just a bunch of petals together, a bunch of stamens, and then one stigma that is finger-like. That's it, single flowers. Uh, so here's a lot of the stamens. Uh, so here's the inside of a dragon fruit. So all of the stamens here with the base of the uh, stigma. And here's the stigma um, with many finger-like or it almost look like an octopus. When we look at the Christmas cactus that we've seen in class, the petals have now formed a tube uh, or they kind of not fuse, but they kind of grow together, uh, creating a tube. So here's where I cut one in half so that I can show you the inside. So we have the stigma here, the style that leads to the ovary at the base, and the rest are just the petals and the sepals and the many stamens uh, coming from the base. And so here is uh, the close up. Uh, of the ovary that will eventually become the fruit with the style is still attached to it. Uh, and here we have uh, pollination would be mainly by different animals. <clears throat> the dragon fruits are gonna be pollinated by bats and they will open during the night. And the same thing with the saguaro cactus or some of the cardone. <clears throat> Flowers are going to be produced at the very top, and they're going to open at night. Uh, also because they are very sensitive and fragile. And if they were to open in the morning when it's very hot, they'll probably burn and die. So it is to the advantage <clears throat> of the cactus to open at night. And so they took advantage of the bats that will rely on the pollen and the nectar and obviously not my picture, but here is uh, a bat going into that uh, flower uh, for the saguaro. Uh, but the same thing in South America, we have the uh, dragon fruit and the very large flower is big enough for a bat to go inside. Or we have the hummingbirds, some of the more colorful, smaller um, trumpet-like with no landing platforms will definitely be for the hummingbirds. And so here we have a <clears throat> calendar cactus and uh, we have a very slender tube uh, so shaped like the beak of a hummingbird and here's a different view so we have the stigma and the many stamens and all the petals and sepals now creating a tube uh, and uh, eventually that will give you the fruit uh, but here's another hummingbird and the flower is just this bottom portion the ovary will be this uh, the green portion uh, about that and or here's a different one uh, and a couple more just examples. So they have adopted that hummingbird as their main pollinator or a bird. And you have a lot of different selections of forms. Or some of the more flat, like uh, this uh, choya, will have insects as their main pollinator. Uh, so here's uh, what I showed you before. Uh, and here's uh, many different native bees and butterflies. Uh, no specialty, just whomever wants some pollen and nectar, come on over and uh, grab it. And here's a bee going to the uh, dragon fruit. Uh, and here's a bee collecting a lot of pollen. The other thing that is very important for you to know is that cactus stamens will move. So here we have uh, the stamen and the stigma. And so uh, if you, if an insect happens to land and try to take the pollen, the stamens are going to compress uh, so that it was going to make sure that the stamens come in close contact with the insects so that they can deliver the pollen or put the pollen. So this is a video. Let's play it and see what happens. My finger is the insect and you can see the stamens move. And so what happens is the plant puts the stamen closer to the stigma, so that kind of guides the insect to get close to the stigma to deliver, deliver the pollen and bring about pollination. 
So it is an actual movement on a plant that you can see with your naked eyes. I know we don't really associate plants with moving, but in this case with cacti, you can actually see it. So next time you see a flower, just put your finger around it like that and you see just what I'm talking about. Uh, and so then that will then uh, lead to the fruit, uh, the fruit which is uh, going to be important for food for many cultures. And keeping in mind that most fruits are going to be edible, not all of them are going to be tasty. And so we have some selections like the dragon fruit here being sold in a, a market in Chiapas, Mexico. Not Chiapas, this is a Ch uh, uh, Jalisco, Mexico. Uh, and so we have a very fleshy fruit. Uh, that's going to be colorful because most often it's going to be some kind of mammal that will be eating uh, the fruit. Uh, and so that's what's going to need, need to be attractive. Uh, here's uh, the mamillarias or those bisnaguillas. And they'll have a fruit that is often going to be referred to as chilillos, which means little peppers, because they're going to be kind of spicy. And I did not know that until my mom showed me. Uh, she told me, like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, they are spicy. Uh, now, whether they have some value as a spice, I don't know, but I guess uh, our children eat them. Uh, and uh, I guess it's, it's not that good, but it's something different and unique. Uh, and here's just the amount of fruit uh, given by one plant. Uh, so, and then here's uh, some more uh, that are ready to eat. Or as they start getting more uh, fleshy, uh, then we have this individual from the wild that an animal took a bite and I'm not sure which one. Or we have the myrtle of cactus, uh, this one being California native, but Baja California here, here growing uh, in Long Beach with the flowers. And uh, the fruits are the size of a grape and they are edible. Uh, and or we have the Peruvian uh, cactus here, uh, very common in the landscape, uh, some of the big ones with the very large fruit that will turn orange and inside red and inside it will be nice fleshy with lots of seeds so the pulp is edible the seeds are edible and uh, not as good as it should be uh, but it is edible if you happen to see it and here's one of the biggest ones that i came across no longer with us the tree died uh, the plant died a couple of years ago but this was one of the a tree that was planted somewhere in the 60s, 70s. Uh, it was in South LA or South Central LA. Uh, or in my trip to Cuba, I happened to come across uh, this individual and uh, this other individual that have a very beautiful uh, yellow fruit. And uh, when I cut it, uh, it was very nice inside. And it wasn't it wasn't that good, but I I, I ate it knowing that it was safe and. Uh, and or in Peru, uh, this is another one that is uh, often sold uh, in the markets and uh, had a chance to try it. It kind of, it's kind of sour like kiwi and it kind of has the same texture, but it, it's not the best one that is out there. Uh, or here we have a, an assortment of different barrel cactus with, uh, not barrel cactus, a columnar cactus uh, with the fruit. Uh, or we have the tunas. Uh, here's the opuntia or the beaver tail with some of the fruits. Uh, the fruits that are loaded with those glaucides. So be very careful if you are going to be eating them because uh, it is not uncommon for people to touch them and eventually the glaucides may get to their mouth and their lips and everything else. Uh, as people have selected them, some of them may have a lot less glaucides.
All right, I guess I lost you for a second. Let's uh, keep going. So let's go back uh, to Hokonostle, which uh, this was, uh, it's a new newest thing. I, like I was not, I had no idea people ate this. Uh, and I started seeing it in the markets and uh, it's the stem. So I guess people have taken the stems and they will do something with it. And I'm still have not, I'm guilty of, uh, have never had it because I don't know how to cook it. I don't know how to prepare it. Uh, but Hokonosles are a type of cactus that is now available at the market and people will buy them and prepare them and eat them. So if anybody knows how to make them, let me know because we'll bring them to you and then we can sample them. Uh, so, and then, so here's some of the uh, epiphyllum, uh, those Christmas cactus with uh, some of the fruits uh, right there. And the saguaro. So the saguaro is going to be very important. So during the flowering season, bats will rely on the pollen and the nectar from the flowers. And uh, the rest of the year, when the flowers, uh, the fruits mature, every animal is going to rely on the fruit. And it is a very known and important fact that during the saguaro fruit season, every animal in the desert is going to be pooping purple because that's kind of the color of the fruit because every animal is going to be eating and go uh, picking out on saguaro because that's going to be what's available. Uh, and so here's some of the barrel cactus uh, with their fruits uh, and or this uh, barrel cactus that I took out so that I can show you the seeds uh, for them. Or some of the fruits are, may also be completely covered with uh, spines and prickles. So you need to be very careful. Uh, here I picked that one from the ground. Uh, but if you want to know what is the most delicious and the best tasting cactus fruit, uh, that would be the one from Jalisco, Mexico. So it is this columnar cactus. Uh, Stenocereus is the genus. Uh, it's commonly known as pitaya, but pitaya is going to be used for most of the cactus fruits. Uh, but keeping in mind that this fruit has had probably 400, 500 years of now selection by people, they have done a lot of work in making it very, very good and sweet. So it's a selection. I don't think there's, uh, there's very few wild individuals. Most of those have gone away and only the selected forms that are have a good fruit are still available or around planted in the orchards in different areas. So here's the fruit that is very spiny. So you need to scrape those away. Uh, and that's how you will normally see them for sale at the roadside during the right season. And that would be in May, June. So that's when there's pitaya season in Jalisco, Mexico. And there's even a pitaya festival where they look for the biggest fruit that is around. And there's different colors. So here's the white and the red. And uh, here's the yellowish uh, or golden yellow, but very, very good and very, very sweet. And here's uh, the red one, also very good and very sweet. Uh, recently, they started importing some to the US. Uh, it is very expensive. It's about $10 a pound for this, uh, but it is not the one from Jalisco. This is coming from Sinaloa or Northern Mexico. Uh, it is very expensive and it is not good. Uh, it doesn't have the right color and the flavor is kind of, uh, it's not sweet. Uh, so it's not worth the $10. Uh, but if you want to try it, go ahead. Uh, but it's not more than recommended. And then in Baja California, we have uh, pitaya agria, sour uh, pitaya. And so here is a native cactus growing in San Quintin, uh, just on side uh, of uh, the uh, marsh. And so here is the fruit. And I don't think I have a photograph. Uh, or also there's going to be some cactus that are going to be known as either jumping choyas or jumping cactus. Just keeping in mind, they're kind of going to crawl. But because of the root system that are on top of the soil or very close to the soil, when you step near them, you're going to be pushing the roots down, kind of jumping the cactus towards you. And so people say, oh, yeah, the cactus jump on me. Well, yes, because you step too closely to the roots and that's what's going to happen. So if you ever hear the term of jumping cactus, it's because of that. 
Uh, and so here's some that are flowering at South Coast Botanic Garden. And uh, here's uh, the flowers and uh, very nice flower. And uh, just to show you the work of bees. So here's a, another tiny video of uh, the bees. And so you can see how quickly they can pick up the pollen. Hopefully it's gonna work. And it just ran the other two. So you saw the very quick when uh, one of the bees comes into contact with the stigma, that's all that it needs for it to be pollinated. So that delivered the pollen that it needed. Uh, and so here is a uh, different, uh, the fruit uh, that I just squeezed to show you the pulp and the seeds. Uh, and here's a couple of other ones with the seeds and the pulp. And there's the seeds for uh, the barrel cactus uh, here's some uh, big cactus. Uh, this is in South Africa. There I am for scale. So South Africa or Africa has a lot of the spurges or the euphorbias. And when you look at spurge and cactus, they may look similar. That is because those were two different plant groups that found the same niche in different parts of the world. And so they all evolved, both evolved the same mechanism for survival. They evolve similar bodies. And so that's why cactus and euphorbias can be confused uh, because they have, uh, they evolve in the same habitat. But obviously euphorbias have a lot of chemicals, cactus do not. And so the cactus have been taken into other parts of the world uh, here in Africa to feed cattle. So they can just kind of burn the paths to get rid of the glaucai and then the cattle will eat them. Uh, can cactus become a weed? The answer is yes. Uh, when these cactus were taken and introduced into Australia, they became a serious pest problem. So they just go, grew out of control until they had to either eliminate them by using diseases, plant diseases or insects. So yes, cactus have not been known to become a problematic uh, plant in other parts of the world, not in California, not in Americas, uh, but in Australia and I'm sure in uh, Africa as well. So now dependent or now cacti being used for feeding animals. Uh, uh, and uh, here's uh, a cactus field. So. Uh, Mexicans, Native Americans have been eating cactus for a very, very long time. So here are some of the cactus pads that are being grown and farmed. And it is when they're very young that you need to eat them, when they're like this. Not the ones that you get from the store that are very hard. Those are too old. So when they're young, nicely green like this, that's when they are perfect. Uh, and that's where they will then become uh, available then you can boil them with some cilantro some onion and some salt and then you can have a kind of slimy i guess that's good or bad your choice and you know, people like them some people don't uh, but it has become it, it is a very valuable food for uh, the people in america for many many years uh, so here's some of the pads uh, been up for for sale and even some cactus jerky, like, no, I am not gonna try that. Looks disgusting. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, but uh, traditionally, I'm sure even before uh, this Spanish came to America, uh, people were buying already crook and prepared cacti uh, just for eating, as we can see in this image, or in some of the markets back in uh, pre-Hispanic era, uh, we could see people uh, harvesting and or preparing the cactus for selling or trading or 
doing something else. Now, after I said that there are no such thing as poisonous cactus and you can probably eat most of them, there are, however, the exceptions and that is going to be the peyote. So peyote is a true cactus. Uh, it is illegal to own them here in the United States. So if you know somebody who has them, don't announce it. Uh, but here was a very nice collection of peyote from uh, Berkeley, no, UC Davis. They had a greenhouse and I was able to see them. Uh, they were, pl the plant that started the CITES uh, list for cactus because traditionally they have been used or they do have some compounds that are hallucinogenic and they have been used in rituals. They can help you go to see the gods. They're probably not gonna kill you. So it's not a toxin like euphorbias, but they will be psychedelic. And so when people started to find out about them, they then stormed the uh, central Mexico, Jalisco, Michoacan era, and they started to plunder the peyotes. So it is now illegal to really harvest them. Only some of the indigenous people for ritual purposes are able to do it from the wild. Uh, but otherwise it was a nice protection for the plant. So it is, them that has some kind of chemical compound that causes that to happen on people. Uh, so here's uh, the peyote, Lophophora willisi, uh, from uh, Michoacan, Northern Jalisco, Mexico, and some of those other areas. There are many species. So there's some species that will kind of also go into Northern Mexico, but I think this Lophophora willisi is the real peyote, the one that I guess gives you the better experience. Uh, so here's uh, the cacti growing in the pot. And there I am uh, when I was very happy to finally have seen them because I've never seen them in my life. I just know of them. Uh, and then in Central America, this is out of Peru. Uh, in South America, we have the San Pedro cactus that I guess also has some uh, compounds, some hallucinogenic compounds uh, somewhere on the skin. And so here being offered for sale at uh, one of the markets in uh, Peru. Uh, and I know people who grow it here. It, this is not illegal. Uh, and I always get students who ask me, do you have any of this cactus? And like, no, nah, unfortunately not. Uh, or we have some of the saguaros, uh, the largest cactus in the world. Uh, so we have uh, saguaro national forest. Here's uh, when they're in bloom uh, and all the beautiful flowers. And uh, here's uh, the close up of those. And uh, here's just some very old uh, cactus. So this could definitely be hundreds of years in age. Uh, they grow very slowly. And I showed you the fruit before. Uh, and here's uh, some of the scenery with the saguaros and uh, more of the scenery. And there's a hawk uh, waiting for a spray. Uh, and that is uh, the cactus that I got married under uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, here's uh, a different view of the scenery of where I got married under some of those saguaro cactus. Uh, and there's also the cochineal scale. So in the old days, it was very difficult to find uh, the purple color or the royal purple. Uh, and so one of the ways that they would get it was to farm this uh, scale insect. It's called cochineal scale. Uh, and the scale naturally has that color. So here I squeeze a couple of them just to show you the coloration of them. So in the early days, uh, some of the Aztec or the indigenous royalty would use this to uh, dye their clothing. And then when uh, the Spanish and the Europeans came to America, then they saw it and some of the more uh, expensive coloring came out of this that was uh, later taken to Europe to give you that royal purple. Uh, but still, there are going to be farms. So here's in Peru where they're farming cactus just so that they can get inoculated with that insect and they can harvest them for the color. So it's still an industry for a natural dye color or natural color. And I heard that it gives you a much nicer purple than some of the synthetic uh, that you see here. And so I mentioned euphorbias and cactus. So very important that you know the difference. Very important that you do not confuse them. Uh, so here's two of them, euphorbia being the colander, the cactus being the dragon fruit. Or here in Long Beach, uh, we have 
uh, the fence cactus here, and then we have the spurge uh, uh, here variegated and a few other succulents and a few other cactus mixed in between with the aloes and a few other things. So we have some similarities. So on the left, we have a columnar cactus, and on the right, we have one of those candelabra type euphorbia, which is also a candelar, ca cal uh, cal columnar ca like. So yes, both of them can have very similar appearance. Uh, on the left, we have a grotesque or a mutated monstrous uh, cactus. And on the right, we have the same thing. Uh, we have a mutated or a crested euphorbia, a spurge. So they could be very similar. Uh, on the left, we have a crested individual uh, cactus. On the right, we have a crested euphorbia. Uh, on the left, we have the peyote, which is going to be the bisnagita like On the right, we have some of those ball-looking euphorbias. So again, similar habitat, same adaptations, similar plant forms. Uh, and then we have the, the cushion type. On the left, we have the cushion-like cactus. On the right, we have the cushion-like spurges. Uh, what is the difference? The difference is that when you cut or injure a cactus, you will never see any white sap or any sap coming out of it. If it's a sap, it's more like the slime, the mucid gel, that kind of you get when you boil cactus. That's about it. However, we know that when you cut a spurge, you will get a white latex uh, that would actually give you the warning that it is poisonous because the euphorbias are poisonous, the cactus are not. Uh, and then when we look at the flowers, they're going to be different. If you remember to last week's uh, seminar, uh, we have a flower cluster. We have four male flowers mixed with one female flower in the center. We have some uh, glands or uh, nectar glands associated, and then we have uh, the petal-like structures, seathophils. Uh, so we have a grouping of flower uh, versus a single flower for a cactus with multi-petals, multi-stems, stamens, and one stigma. So we have a grouping of flower versus a single flower. But when we look at them, the flowers on a cacti will definitely be a lot showier. They're going to be nicer and they should be a lot bigger. Uh, and uh, if we look at the fruit, uh, we can see that a cactus will have a kind of like a fleshy, it will be a true berry, fleshy fruit with multi seeds. Whereas in the spurge, we found like a three segment capsule that even if it's fleshy, it will eventually dry and there's not really any kind of meat for you to eat, or there's just going to be some seeds inside. Uh, so that would be another big difference. So you eat the left, you don't eat the right. And if we look at the, spick, the prickles, the spines, if you remember with the spurge, the origin of them were the stipules that are modified. And that's why there's only two or it's a pair of uh, uh, prickles. Whereas in the cacti, we have the areolis, which is that compressed bud uh, and the uh, leaves, which are now uh, the spines will be in a round circular pattern and there's going to be multiple uh, or more than two, whereas here it's always going to be two uh, and then you have a node. So uh, that would be probably the easiest way if you were just to have the two stems of the plants together, just look at the spines, the prickles, the uh, defense, uh, and there's going to be two or it's going to be circular pattern on them. So that's going to be another very important characteristic. Uh, and so when we look at the flowers, there is definitely something beautiful. Uh, I will have to say that next to passion flowers, maybe cacti may have some of the nicest flowers. Uh, maybe looking it out with some of the orchids. Uh, so here's some of the native cacti uh, in that island. Uh, here's some more in Baja, uh, Mamillarias. Uh, here's just some more scenery of uh, the cacti here in the desert and the different forms just in one place. Here's one growing in the wild, just in a crack of a big boulder. 
it's like, wow, that's amazing. And some just growing on the shingles of the roofs of houses and they find uh, a nice place to live. Uh, here's some Amilaria also growing in the shingles uh, and very happy with flowers and fruit. Uh, here's some that are used as a deterrent. So they put them on top of the fences uh, or the walls. The walls are made with adobe. So that's a perfect medium for them to grow. And uh, people are not going to jump the fence because that's not going to be good. Uh, here's uh, the dragon fruit. Uh, here's when uh, it actually flower. You may have seen this uh, in our garden. And uh, here's the dragon fruit being used also as a deterrent growing on top of a fence uh, wall. And uh, dragon fruits growing throughout uh, Long Beach with uh, fruits and the fruits being offered uh, for sale here and this is an okay much better than the peruvian and uh, i've often had it uh, in our fruit lab and some of the other uh, individuals colors that you may see out there and a few more that i had and then uh, i was able to go to one of the last uh, dragon fruit festivals where they would have a lot of sampling so these are different varieties that you could sample from and be able to determine whether they're good or bad uh, and uh, or pick out on them. So they have now come, uh, come, they now come in different colors. And the man responsible for that is Edgar Valdivia. So about 25 years, he kind of took this plant under his wing, the dragon fruits, and started doing hybridizing and selection and kind of got dragon fruits to the fame that they have right now here in the US. Uh, and so here's where they're looking at new, a new one that somebody hybridized and then they harvest it. And I was able to take a photograph with him and the dragon fruits. Uh, but I had the chance to try something new. So this is a very new hybrid. Uh, and we tested it for uh, the amount of sugar and kind of sample it and uh, determine if it was good or bad or if it merits more attention or more work. And this is uh, when they cut it. Uh, and we sample it. So it was a nice opportunity. Uh, here is a, a different. This is uh, the Argentinian apple cactus. Uh, and this is also growing in our garden. Uh, so here's uh, some of the fruits. Uh, and uh, here's a very small fruit. And inside, it's, it's a little dry. Some people may refer to it as eating sand. Uh, but that's all right. It's still a good fruit, I think in my opinion. And here's uh, just in comparison to the other dragon fruits that we are growing here in the garden. And then not too long ago, I was able to see the yellow dragon fruit, uh, the yellow dragon fruit that comes from uh, Ecuador, uh, but here is from Colombia at a ranch. And uh, here's a fruit and there I am for scale. So this is how they commercially grow them. Uh, and uh, here's the flower. I mean, a flower, and there's the fruit. The fruit is, has uh, prickles and spine, but those get removed before they ship them into the US. So, about three, four years ago, they started to import them from Ecuador, and now they have gotten very affordable and they are very good. So, this is in Colombia, uh, and inside it's going to be nice and white, and it's going to be very sweet and juicy. So, if you never had them, you should give them a try now that they have gone down in price. And uh, last year we had it for our fruit lab, uh, which we couldn't do this year because of what we're doing, dealing with. Uh, Lotus land and some of the displays for of cactus and succulents, different specimens right there uh, in the cactus garden. Uh, and uh, a couple more here of the old man cactus. And, uh, Although we take cactus for granted here in the U.S. because it's a common thing, uh, elsewhere in the world, they are a very exotic plant. And here's in England, and they are grown in a conservatory. They are grown under glass. They are protected. And also in Japan, they are very sought after by collectors. And an exotic plant to them is a cactus. And for us, it's just another plant. So just be aware of that. Sometimes we take for granted the things that grow naturally here, whereas somewhere else, it is something very exotic and they put a lot of money into having some beautiful collection of cactus here. Uh, I think this is the Princess of Wales 
uh, conservatory in England. And uh, some of the collection, yes, Europeans came to the Americas, they plundered the hills, they took back many cactus, many of them without flowers, and uh, they waited, they babied them, they kept them alive, they flower, and voila, new species this described from Europe, Germany, it's, it happens. So many new species of cactus are being described from Europe because of collections back in the days when they were allowed to take them. Uh, so here's some of the cactus that were flowering from that collection from Kew Botanic Gardens. Uh, and that's just a lot more. Uh, here's the cactus and succulent beauty pageant. Uh, so some of the better specimen that are grown by cactus geeks, uh, cactus and succulent geeks uh, being displayed for a blue ribbon. Uh, and here's some of the better specimens and some with flowers and some with not. Uh, and uh, if you never had a chance to see one of these shows or pageants, you should, because it's kind of interesting. Uh, you see a lot of crazy people like cactus and cyclists, like, ooh, okay, interesting. Uh, but beautiful plants, uh, again, very well cared for, and some of the big winners uh, right there. Around Long Beach, don't be surprised, uh, they're going to be everywhere. Uh, some of them acting as nice deterrent, some of them very focal. Uh, some uh, mine cart here loaded with cactus, uh, somewhere here in Long Beach. Uh, and or uh, by Naples Islands, here's a uh, nice cactus or in the back of somebody's, uh, some alley, we have cacti or in the landscape, we have different cacti being used. Uh, because of all this water conservation, drought tolerant, we started seeing a lot more cactus and succulent gardens. So I think they're, they still need more work, but uh, they're, they're more common, uh, even in just simple containers or more of the modern uh, architecture here. We have some nice uh, display of cactus and or other succulents uh, right there. And uh, one with a turtle. Uh, and uh, this one is the spiral one. So it's just a mutation that uh, causes the stem to spiral. Uh, and then you might see something like this. Uh, so many of them do get grafted. Uh, so a mutation that has a nice colorful coloration is grafted onto the stem of a dragon fruit. They're both cacti, they're compatible. And so they sell it as a cutesy little plantlet. Uh, Home Depot has them, not uncommon. Uh, so here they are. So. Don't be ashamed to buy them uh, if you want one. And over here's uh, a couple of other, uh, a different graft. Uh, and then this, do not buy this. Uh, a cacti disguised as an elf. Uh, Christmas is coming and holidays is coming. I could not resist taking the picture, but no, uh, you should not buy this because uh, that's not right. Uh, cactus uh, topiaries, very common, or this. Uh, where they have glued a uh, fake flower or one of those uh, straw flowers. No, and uh, they did such a horrible job that you can see the glue uh, kind of dripping uh, and now has solidified. It's like, yeah, no. Uh, here's another one, no. And here's another one, uh, no. And this one, uh, no, and that one, no. Oh, this one's horrible. You can see the glue like dripping all over. Like, why would you do something like this? Uh, no, when in fact, cactus do have very nice flowers. So if you are patient and you wait for them, you will get a really nice flower compared to this ugly straw looking thing that you're gonna just put on top. Uh, this is unacceptable. So yeah, I, you should not be buying this. Uh, or this cosmic, uh, why would you paint uh, ugly colors on a cactus? Uh, it's like, ah, uh, no, this is not good. This is not, you should not be buying this. And even starting to flower, but no, do not buy the cosmic plants or the masmillarias here painted in different colors. Yeah, no, I uh, hope you have never to hear that you have purchased one of this, so I better not see you carrying one at Home Depot. Instead, appreciate the cactus for what they are here. 
uh, some of the native cactus in Cuba, having some of the most beautiful scenery of the ocean uh, and uh, uh, the Bay Area here with no boats, no advertisement, nothing. Uh, beautiful cactus and beautiful spaces. Uh, and here, different kinds. Or in some uh, of the islands uh, in uh, Sio Cortez, uh, we have uh, some beautiful displays of uh, cactus from the Sonora Desert. Or here, made into an artistic uh, metal sculpture. Or we have some of the saguaro here, some of the largest one. Not the saguaro cactus, or this is a cardon. This is the uh, in uh, Baja California and uh, not in Senada, in sort of further south. Uh, here's a different view of the same cactus. So this is one view that I showed in the beginning, and this is a different view of the same cactus, uh, and then pulling the plant. So I think that's the last one. Oh, and uh, with some uh, pelicans uh, looking over the horizon, uh, that beautiful cactus on top. I think that should be the last one. So are there any questions? Oh, it's kind of long, but it's a lot of things to talk about cactus. All right. Well, I'll stop the recording.